I, Dr. Crush asked me to talk a little bit about laboratories. This is going to be freelance on the whiteboard. Um, I am hoping that you all will be your normal PJ and medic self and feel free to chime in at any time. Tell me I'm doing something stupid. I want to make sure I'm on target. I don't want to go too low or too high, but let's start with laboratories. And the first thing I want to start with is uh, in the trauma bay, we'll talk about laboratories because this is one, I've, as Doc said, I've had seven deployments and most of what, and all of what I'm going to tell you, I learned on deployment and then took back to Cincinnati, Ohio, where we ran a trauma center. You all know that if we wait for the vital signs in our young warriors uh, to become deranged, become tachycardic, hypotensive, and oliguric, we have waited till they are 40% bled to death and that's too late and we're too low and slow. So the idea is to spot them early and to get a, to stay out of trouble rather than to get out of trouble. So in the trauma bay in Balad, I was taught five trigger points. And these are all points that you will be able to get with an ISTAT. And actually um, my hope and wish is, is that we actually start pushing this out into the pre-hospital arena. This is absolutely germane for a Pedro unit absolutely germane for the rotary wing evac team carrying an ISTAT. You can spot these patients from the point of injury during transport. So what are those five trigger points? Number one is any BP less than a 90 systolic, okay? And you're not gonna do that with a cuff. You're gonna use T triple C uh, and that would be a pulse that's not palpable in the groin or the radial artery, although that's probably a little bit lower, but that's trigger point number one. Now here's where the labs come into play. Laboratory number two, hemoglobin less than 11. You get that on an ISTAT cartridge, okay? Trigger point three is an INR greater than 1.5. That doesn't come on the ISTAT basic cartridge, but you can get ISTAT cartridges that do INR or point of care INR testing. And I'll tell you in a little bit why you should. Um, we're, we used it in Cincinnati reliably, um, and I'm trying to get it down here in San Antonio, and I think eventually we should have it in pre-hospital care. Um, trigger point number four is a base deficit of minus six or greater, okay? And then uh, trigger point number five is a temperature of 96.5 or less. All right. Now, Perceptive PJs already start to look at these trigger points and tell me why we use these trigger points. I can tell you that if I wait for blood pressure, pulse, and urinary output, I'm going to be low and slow. And actually, statistically, unless your pulse is greater than 120 or less than 60, in between that, statistically, you're as likely to live or die as any other patient in that population. These trigger points work because if you're on the wrong side of any one of these five trigger points, I can show you and back it up with science that you are statistically more likely to die if you're on the bad side of trigger points. And I can tell you with soft science that the more trigger points that you've racked up, the more likely you are to need surgery, to require blood and to try to die. So true statement as a trauma czar running mass casualties, the way we use these is that we would get these point of care testing the techs would write them and have them back within five minutes. They'd stick them on a white sheet of paper and stick them on this, uh, the curtain rail that was above each patient. So that as a trauma czar, you could sit there and look for who had the worst trigger points or who had the most trigger points. And that was the patient who got your attention next. The techs would underline the one. So we talked about this one. That's pretty self-evident. What about a hemoglobin less than 11? Okay. Why is that a trigger point? Well, you all know very well that if you're shot or the casualty shot and they're bleeding whole blood out onto the sand, you could check their hemoglobin or hematocrit and it most likely would be normal. And I agree. What a hemoglobin less than 11 means to me is probably one of two things. Either that the patient's been sick long enough that blood has re-equilibrated or what it can also mean is that in the pre-hospital care setting or until you got your hands on them, somebody was giving them too much crystalloid and hemodiluting them out. Okay, so hemoglobin less than 11 works. I can tell you that if you arrive in my trauma bay with a hemoglobin less than 11, you're about twice as likely to die than if you're having a hemoglobin greater than 11. INR greater than 1.5. What is INR? INR is international normalized ratio. It's a clotting test initially used to evaluate warfarin, but it tells you whether a patient's coagulopathic or not. 
What's fascinating to me as a trauma surgeon is there's lots of literature now that tells us that the moment the trauma patient hits the trauma bay, and this can be within 30 minutes of getting whacked, the patients can already be coagulopathic. And about 15% of seriously injured patients show up with coagulopathy as manifested by an INR greater than 1.5. All right. Now, I wrote these in sequence for the reason specifically, hang on with me. Let's go to trigger point number four. And as we talk about blood gases, we'll talk more about acid-base balance. But base deficit, as you know, is a way of calculating the amount of acid in the bloodstream. Put another way, it is the calculation of how much buffer or bicarbonate you would have to add back into the bloodstream in order to make the patient's pH a normal level. A base deficit greater than minus six means the patient's generating acid. In the trauma setting, if they're generating acid, it's lactic acidosis. Those are all things we'll talk about, all things we need to know. But in those first 10 minutes in the trauma bay, if that patient has a base deficit of minus six and is the one of four patients who does and everybody else has a base deficit less than minus six, this is the patient who's gonna get my attention first. That means they're silently sitting in shock that means they're compensating with catecholamines to keep their blood pressure normal, but their tissue is perceiving inadequate oxygen delivery and generating acid. Then finally, this last one, a temperature of 96.5. All right. Now, smart PJs, smart medics out there, what do you see these last three things being? Triad. Triad. There you go. And that's exactly why it is. This is the triangle of death. Coagulopathy acidosis, okay, and hypothermia. These are shorthand ways of focusing you. And I, I'm in scrubs right now because we have a patient who this morning just came in absolutely doing that to us. And this is what I got to teach my residents. This is what you senior PJs tell your young PJs. This is why you do these. And within five minutes, you can spot the patient. Honest to goodness, after 20 years of walking into the trauma bay, when I walk in and see the patient and I'm getting handoff from you guys, what I'm trying to figure out and listen in quickly for is how much or how deep that patient is in the triangle of death. Dead on right. And if they're not in the triangle of death, keep them out of it. If they are in the triangle of death, how quickly can you get them out of it? Okay. Now, let's focus specifically on this one. Uh, and let me do this. All right, so 2005, 2007, I had the privilege of being in Balad. Y'all been there, you know it was friggin' hot. It was 115 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever, 115 degrees on an average day. And we were getting lots of sick Marines coming out of Fallujah. The average core temperature of Marines reaching us from Fallujah after the operating room was, anybody wanna take a guess? Average arrival temperature. Yeah, 96.0, okay? Now, the scientist, the doctor in me knows a couple of things and we'll explain, you guys can tell me because you're the guys who are out there, not me, but I'll tell you why that happens even when it's 117 degrees outside. But the other thing you have to know about 96 degrees does what to the clotting cascade? Your clotting cascade is nothing more than enzymes. You don't have to know chemistry of enzymes, but you do need to know enzymes are unique for two reasons. Enzymes are proteins, and they are exquisitely temperature sensitive, and what else are they exquisitely sensitive to, Chris? That's why the triangle of death is the triangle of death. Both of these I can show you, or Doc can show you. I can show you scientific papers over the last 15 years that have gone in, taken blood, and intentionally made blood colder and colder, and then looked at the individual enzymes. You know there's 12 different enzymes that make blood clot. All of the 12 are effective to more or lesser degrees, but 96 is a really important temperature because those scientific studies show me that at 96 degrees, your normal blood drawn out of your arm, any of your guys' arms right now, if I cool it to 96 degrees, it clots with only 35% efficiency. All right? And you won't know that because all your clotting tests that are run warm the blood back up to normal temperature. That's why I can be in the operating room with a patient who's cold and not see blood clotting, but I send it to the laboratory and test it. The first thing the laboratory does is warms the blood back up to 98.6. So they miss this hypothermic 
blockage of the clotting cascade, okay? And then acidosis is also important because acidosis, a, a, an enzyme is nothing but a protein. You change the pH of a protein, it uncoils, it no longer works effectively. So again, that's why the triangle of death is a triangle of death. Now, take me through the sequence of a Marine getting injured out west in Fallujah and getting to me at 96 degrees. I will tell you, typical patient had a laparotomy done, okay? And they had damage control surgery, all right? So the anesthesia and the Navy surgeons do a, a horrific, do a, a wonderful, heroic job of saving that kid's life, but they're saying, we're shipping them to Balad, or we're shipping them to Bagram, or we're shipping them out of AFRICOM somewhere. Okay, so what does the anesthesiologist say to himself, himself or herself? What are you gonna do? You're gonna keep the kid paralyzed, right? So what do they administer right then and there? A big healthy dose of neuromuscular blockade, all right? Because they want the kid paralyzed because they don't want the kid waking up, extubating himself with the nurse, the medic, or the doc who's transporting him from Fallujah to Balad, all right? So that's step number one. Step number two, what are they transported in? What is the thermal protecting device? Honest to God, the first generation were body bags. We cut a hole in the head and they came in a plastic body bag. That was really bad because it held all the fluid in them. So they'd come off the OR table, intubated, chemically paralyzed, still probably drenched in fluids and blood and IV fluids and wet. They'd get put into a body pack bag or an HPK and they're wet, all right? Now, the Army has dedicated medevacs. Pedro, you guys are a dedicated medevac unit, but you're not necessarily stanchion. What did the Marines use for their medevac? And so what would that aircraft of opportunity be? Usually be a CH-53, and they would get loaded right onto the aluminum floor of a CH-53 in a NATO stretcher, in a body bag, and they were wet, all right? So what kind of heat loss do you now create? A heart center. Radiation. So you conduct, you have conduction, Evaporative. Okay. Conduction. And then you know the gunner's windows are open, right? So you have convection of the air coming across the back. And then if I did that to you guys, what would be your defense to thermoregulate? You would do what if you got cold? You would shiver. These kids won't shiver because neuromuscular blockade. So they come across the ground. I don't know what altitude they fly. They're flying lickety split. The wind's coming across them. And between conducting and losing heat right out their backs to the aluminum floor and the air sweeping over them, they would arrive to us at 96 degrees. And seeing this time and time was the first performance improvement protocol that came across the joint trauma surgeon or the JTS joint trauma system was to look at arrival temperatures. That's how come the HPK got um, uh, started. That's how come now if you slip load a patient and if you slip load them on your Pedros, it's a wise idea to put some blankets between that NATO stretcher and the aluminum floor. You all have slept on the aluminum floors. You know how cold they are. You got to protect your patient from that. Does that all make sense? So hypothermia, uh, acidosis, and coagulopathy in the trauma bay, we want to avoid at all costs. Those five trigger points you can get, you can get with an ISTAT. I use those to this day. I use them today. We had a patient who was an elderly patient Bell uh, presented to an outside hospital, was intubated because his GCS was thought to be nine, although the physician there told me his APGAR score was nine. So you can see that we have a lot of training to do here in San Antonio as well, but we sorted through that. But he arrived here with a temperature of 93.5 because he'd been chemically paralyzed. So the other thing you have to do is you have to develop a knee jerk as a medic that if you hear the word succinylcholine or rocuronium, the next thing you need to be thinking about is keeping that patient warm. Does that all make sense? All right. Um, let's track a little bit more. Now we'll track out of the trauma bay and we'll go up to the ICU. All right. We'll talk about blood gases, arterial blood gases. All right. There's three things you need to know about a blood gas. First is pH. The second is P small a. O2, and the third is going to be P small a CO2. All right. pH normal range is 735 to 745. All right. 
Arterial blood gas can be drawn from any radial artery, ephemeral artery, any arterial source. It can be run on your eye stat, and that's the result. It, you're going to get that result back, and we're going to know if we are if the patient is regulating their pH to a normal level. What influences pH in the human body are these two things: are going to be um, the level of acidosis, metabolic acidosis, and the level of pCO2. All right. So this leads to a metabolic, and this leads to a respiratory acidosis. Open mic, somebody's typing out there too. All right, thanks. Let's see, let's get back, see if we can get back to a regular. All right, so first thing, pH. I look at the pH, if it's seven, less than 7.35, it is an acidosis. If it's greater than 7.45, it is an alkalosis. For the consideration, especially of the bleeding hemorrhagic patient, what we're gonna focus first on is acidosis because we wanna spot the metabolic acidosis that occurs with the generation of lactate because a patient is not perfusing themselves. And remember the basic definition of shock, a priori is inadequate oxygen delivery of tissue. When we stop delivering oxygen tissue, we generate lactate that's manifested as acidosis. You can measure that on a blood gas. So if we get a pH less than 735, by definition it is an acidosis. Then the next step is there are two types of acidosis. But it can be respiratory or metabolic. How do you sort that out? The next thing we have to do is look at the amount of carbon dioxide in the bloodstream because excessive carbon dioxide dissociates and creates the acid of a respiratory acidosis. So Dr. J, rule of thumb, the only thing that you can need to keep in your, your book or write down or keep when you interpret blood gases is the following. I know that for every 10 tor or every 10 millimeter change in PCO2, your pH will change or go down by 0 0.08 pH units. That is to say, if I have a blood gas of 7.28, a PCO2 of 50, a PO2 doesn't matter because that's not going to create of 85, okay? I can look at this blood gas and I say, first of all, the pH is below 735. Therefore, it is an acidosis. What kind is it, respiratory or metabolic? I then go to this rule. That says for every 10 tor change in PCO2, and this is up by 10, my pH should fall by 0 0.08. That is to say then, looking at this blood gas, I would say to myself, this blood gas, if it was purely due to hypercapnia, I would expect the pH to be 7.32. If the pH was 7.32, then you could tell me not only is it an acidosis, but it is a pure respiratory acidosis. In this case, the patient's pH is not the predicted 732, it's actually 728. Why? The difference between 732 down to 7.28 must be additional acid that's not accounted for by the respiratory acidosis tree. Therefore, where's that acid coming from? That's metabolic. So that tells you, in addition to being underventilated, the patient is also generating some degree of lactic acid, which is resulting in a metabolic as well as a respiratory acidosis. It's that simple. So then your job is twofold. What is your response? How do you treat this patient in the back? of your 130 as you're transporting them to the next phase of care. What would be your two primary focuses 
of addressing this acidosis. I would increase the breathing rate, Doc. Well, very good. And you just heard, vent so breathing rate. And you just heard uh, lectures on ventilators earlier this week, okay? You want to in increase breathing rate. I'm going to make you be a little bit more precise. You are right. But so he's not off-gassing, so you're helping him to off-gas more CO2 by increasing the ventilatory rate. Vent yeah, well, yes, but it's more than vent so. It's actually, I don't want you to use the term ventilatory rate. I want you to be more precise and I want you to improve or increase something so called minute, what? Minute volume. volume. Minute, ven minute ventilation, minute volume. Correct. Because, and you need to know that because minute ventilation is the sum of what times what? Tidal volume. volume and respiratory rate. Right. Very good. Therefore, the reason I'm hacking on you right now or, or being precise is everybody said I'm going to increase the rate. That's true, and that's probably could work perfectly fine, but really you have two options. You could increase the rate or Sorry, increase your tidal volume. What about positive pressure, Doc? Positive pressure of what? PEEP or CPAP? PEEP. Yeah. Okay, there are two parameters that fix ventilation and two parameters that fix oxygenation, okay? Ventilation has to do with the elimination of CO2. Oxygenation has to do with your SAT, okay? The two dials that you twist on a ventilator to make oxygenation better are PEEP, and FiO2. So increasing pressure or PEEP, that's a way to open up alveoli. When you open up more alveoli, you're better at oxygenation. But what gets rid of CO2 isn't opening the alveoli, it's flushing them back and forth in mass movement of gas. Therefore, if your problem is CO2, you're going to address minute ventilation, and those two dials are going to be respiratory rate and tidal volume. Pressure, which is PEEP, and oxygen, which is FiO2, are going to address oxygenation, okay? And really, when it comes down to ventilators, don't let um, any doc convince you that it's, it's, not, it's, it's really tough. There's only four buttons you need to twist. And whether you're using the 731, and at a later day, in a later time, I'll tell you that there are other ventilators out there that, in my opinion, are really dangerous. Um, but we'll go into that later. But the 731 or any ventilator that we use out there transports, the 754, the T1, the LTV, the ones that are going to be coming out because of this COVID, you really only need to know how to change the rate, the tidal volume, the FiO2, and the P. Okay? So it's that simple. So we talked about this blood gas. You are correct. In your first, you're going to have a two-pronged attack to fix this acidosis. The first of which is to improve this by increasing minute ventilation. Okay, that's right. And then the second prong is to fix your metabolic acidosis. How are you going to do that? Sodium bicarb. Ah, sodium bicarb. What's sodium bicarb going to do? That's a, that, is, that is the answer that nine out of 10 of my doctors would give but it's not gonna work. Why will sodium bicarb not work? This is what everybody forgets. So Dr. Crusher, are you still on board? Yes, yes. You got it, you're the, sci yeah. you're the scientist, not me, but you're the chemist, but keep me honest here. Let's go through why bicarb doesn't work, all right? Sodium bicarb. does what? Dissociates into sodium and plus two and bicarbonate ion and generates CO2 plus water, okay? When you use sodium bicarb, what you're trying to do is you're trying to absorb, use, absorb uh, the acid by driving this equation to the creation of carbon dioxide and water. 
But if the patient already has elevated CO2 levels, this elevated CO2 is not going to allow the equation to move to absorb acid. It's actually going to try, it's, it's going to keep bicarb over here as bicarb and not allow it to do its buffering job because you're trying to drive the equation against elevated CO2. That's a little bit of chemistry, but bicarb never works in the setting of elevated CO2, number one. Number two, your trauma medics. When you come across a patient who is acidotic, the number one cause of acidosis is what? Blood loss. Shock. Right? And therefore, if it's shock, it's inadequate delivery of what to where? Oxygen to the tissues. Right. So your strategy, your first and foremost strategy, and then we can talk forever, is I, this metabolic acidosis must mean that my patient's tissues are not receiving enough oxygen to some body or chunk of tissue isn't seeing enough oxygen. So my job is to improve the delivery of oxygen to the patient. So far, so good? Copy? All right, so what's your first strategy? Give blood. Stop the bleeding, okay. And All right, and give blood. I agree. Wait for one second, because this will be the final thing we'll talk about. And then I want to open it up to questions, because if I can help you guys understand this, this lecture will be worth its weight in gold. And this is the lecture again. Every night I'm on trauma call, I have to walk my residents through it. They don't get it. You guys are get it because you watch this happen to your people. We decided that our patient has a metabolic acidosis because oxygen delivery is inadequate. All right, we got to fix it. You can only fix it if you know how it, it works. So oxygen delivery is the sum of two components. What are those two components? Flow times content. Yes? Nothing, the pressure. Up, nothing up my sleeve, all right? What is flow in the human body? Blood what pressure. Not, not blood pressure. Car cardiac output. Yeah. Yeah. Cardiac output is flow. Cardiac output is flow, all right? What is content? Content is the amount of oxygen your blood holds. Your blood holds oxygen in two forms. What are those two forms? Hemoglobin. Yep. Dissolved. Very good. Stop right there and we're going to walk through this. All right. This is the heart. This is the pump. What makes a pump work is that it has to be loaded correctly. It has to have preload. Right? So your first job is to make give them fluids that fill the heart so the heart pumps efficiently and effectively. And if the patient's bleeding, the best fluid to give them back is blood because you do two things at once. You fill the pump back up, you make the heart work better, and you improve content. Now, let's talk about this for just a second because, and you don't need to commit this to memory, but you need to just understand this. How do we actually calculate this? The number's actually calculated by taking your hemoglobin in grams and multiplying it by a number that represents how much oxygen hemoglobin holds if it is fully saturated. Then you said plus how much is dissolved. That's a tiny amount. All right. Now, why do I ask that you look at this? I ask that you look at this for the following reasons. If you know this, then you see one, two, three parameters that you in the back of your Pedro can fix. You can fix cardiac output, you can fix hemoglobin, you can fix oxygen saturation. Which one of those three is the most important or the most valuable? Which one of those three is the least valuable and gives you the least bang for your buck? What's the most, what's the least valuable of those three things to fix? PAO2. SAO2. 
saturation. You're exactly right again, Chris. Why? Why is SaO2 not worth chasing? Because you guys know saturation could be if it's not if your saturation is 92%, it's 0.92. If you make your saturation better and put them up to 0.98, 98%, you've only changed the math and the oxygen delivery by 0.06. Not very useful. What if you give that casualty a unit of whole blood? Their hemoglobin, which might have been eight, will go up to nine or 10 perhaps. Well, probably nine or 9.5. And each one of those grams that go up, you multiply by 1.34. So therefore, you improve that 1.34 to roughly 20 times this chain. What's the cardiac output? Cardiac average range uh, to five to about 10. You can improve them by 20%. You can make them from seven to about 12. Again, two integer, two integer improvement, which is about 30 times more effective. Therefore, whoever answered blood, you improve cardiac output so you made that better and you make this better simultaneously. That's absolutely how you fix that metabolic acidosis. That's why you give whole blood. That's why you make sure the pump is loaded up full and that will get rid of your lactic acidosis. So now you've got the guy and you're at Bob Fenty or you're in a little bit of prolonged field care, all right? You're looking at the patient. You're gonna draw another blood gas. What are you gonna look at on the blood gas to know that you're going in the right or wrong way? Let's take that patient who had a PCO2 of 50, pH of 7 to 8. You draw your next blood gas. And I'll give you the blood guess, and you tell me whether we're winning or losing. Your next blood guess becomes What do you think? Better or worse? Unchanged. So let's walk through it. Acidosis or alkalosis? Strictly speaking, it's a mild acidosis because it's less than 7.4, okay? So if it's an acidosis, we look at PCO2 now. What's a normal PCO2? Thirty-five to forty-five. Right? So that is normal. That's not contributing so that there is no respiratory acidosis. Therefore, the fact that this is not perfectly normal is a metabolic acidosis. And that number is below my trigger point of minus six, but that is, he still has got a little bit of acid in his bloodstream. And this is where and I think perhaps I'm getting a little bit far astray now, but one of the things you'll often see in your patients, especially during prolonged field care, you can be going absolutely in the right way, blood pressure pulse, patient's looking better, he's warming up. It takes a while, depending on how shocked your patient was, it takes a while for that patient to flush all that acid out. And sometimes you just have to sit and be patient and let all that acid wash out of the patient in order to, um, uh, to for them to fully correct. But the, the pH is affected both by the PCO2 level and then by metabolic or acid or metabolic um, buffers that you, you can't necessarily see uh, by the PCO2, but you can presume based upon that equation. I'm going to go yeah, for a sec. That, yeah, go ahead. When it comes to that trigger point, you were saying uh, that we're shooting for or our trigger points below uh, minus six, but uh, since it's a negative, like, isn't that above? Are we looking for a, like above or below? Great point. This is a little bit of semantics and it confuses everybody, but, and you'll actually see the papers write it in both ways. So it, we're imprecise. But if you call it a base deficit, it means it's a negative number. So strictly speaking, I should say a base deficit of six, which means it is a negative number of six, which means it is acid. That is correct. So um, we have, so if you got progressively more 
acidotic and you're deteriorating, that number, instead of being six, will go to eight, will go to 10. Whether it has a negative in front of it or not, a bigger number is more acid if it's a base deficit. A smaller number is less acid if it's a base deficit. Did I make sense of that? Or did I just make it muddier? Makes sense. Uh, so J is, uh, is minus nine more acidotic and worse than minus six? That is correct. Minus nine is worse. Minus three is better. Zero would be better. And plus two would be actually so good that you actually have buffer now and not acid. That is correct. And minus nine would make the hair on the back of my neck crawl in a trauma casualty. In fact, the guy who came in today had a base deficit of minus eight. And that's why I told the residents they couldn't leave his side. And that's why the residents had to stay at the patient's side until we delivered him straight up to the operating room where um, he currently is finishing up getting his bifrontal craniectomies. Yes. Other questions? Cool, so we have uh, 15 minutes left. Can you give an overview of um, electrolytes, lactate, other stuff that, that they might be looking at on COVID patients, just general blood test stuff. Yeah, sure can. So we're all beginning, we're all still learning about what the most important endpoints are for COVID. But generally speaking, in the ICU, there's three broad, you're going to get Chemistries, as Doc said. The second one you're going to get is a CBC or complete blood count. And the third one we're going to get, which we spent some time on, is the arterial blood gas. All right. So the chemistry, sometimes called a renal panel, a renal profile, chem sevens, everybody has a different name for them. But basically, and you'll often see it, written like this. Are the basic electrolytes that are 90% of the important things that need to be monitored in the patient, whether they're just coming to the emergency room or they're critically ill in the ICU. Walking you through here, sodium and potassium, Na and potassium, usually written in this sequence, okay, obviously are very important to maintaining cellular homeostasis and keeping the electrical gradients. Chloride and bicarbonate, Cl and HCO3. This one is actually a nice one to look at. And it's called the blood urea nitrogen and the creatinine. So these are your chemical electrolytes that keep your cells working and your electrical charge working. This is actually more related to kidney function. Creatinine is the basic filtering capability of the human body. You'd normally like in a young, healthy patient, you want that creatinine number to be 1.0 or probably less than 1.5 in a patient, all right? Um, it is something you're gonna watch for patients, especially young soldiers with myoglobinuria from crush injuries, from ischemic injuries, et cetera. BUN is blood urea nitrogen, and that's useful because the efficiency of the kidney and how effective it is at, being, at filtering blood and how much blood it's actually able to filter is oftentimes looked at by looking at this relationship. So the one shorthand that I think we'll just use for today and can go into later, um, these two numbers, the BUN creatinine, can be used as a shorthand. The ratio can look at total volume status, okay? The typical BUN creatinine ratio should be less than 20. That is a BUN of 17 and a creatinine of 1.5 would be a BUN creatinine ratio less than 20. That would indicate a relatively normally hydrated patient as opposed to somebody with a, creat or with a BUN of 60 and a creatinine of 
that ratio is 40, uh, 50, 40, yeah, 40. Um, that would tend to indicate a patient who is volume contracted or dehydrated. So the BUN creatinine ratio, there are normal ranges that you can commit to memory or keep a pocket card um, that I don't think would miss, you know, you don't need to commit to memory. Um, but this is your shorthand for looking at your hydration status of your patient. And then obviously glucose, all of you are familiar with that's glucose homeostasis. And um, in the deployed setting and a combat casualty setting, most of our patients are going to be young, healthy, and be able to maintain their glucose. Oftentimes with the stress and catecholamines, you might see a little bit of hyperglycemia in young trauma patients, but not more than that. So um, those are your chemistry tests. Let me get some room here and we'll go on to CDC. Questions about chemistries? Those are all available, by the way, on your ISTAT. ISTAT cartridges are worth their weight in gold. It was the one thing we would routinely steal when we got uprange to Germany out of their ICU and had to go back down to CCAT teams. We would always steal as many ISTAT cartridges as we can get. Um, you ask about lactate, Dr. Rush. Um, lactate, the one rule that I know that I still teach is that lactate tells you if you're winning or losing the battle. And specifically, the lactate that you watch is 2.0. As you get sicker, and now this is break, break, different than base deficit. The sicker you get, the less oxygen you deliver to your, tish, to your tissue, the more lactic acid you will generate, and the higher this number goes. Therefore, a lactic acid of one is better than a lactic acid of two. A lactic acid of five is really worrisome. A lactic acid of eight is, holy shit, this patient's going to die. Lactate is generated when we get into anaerobic metabolism. Now, here's one other rule that I go to the bank on. I know from a very good study done over 40 years ago, they looked at over 400 trauma patients and they looked at their lactate. Over the first three days, they were in the trauma ICU. Stand by one minute, see who we got, because I'm on trauma call, I apologize. But, uh, that's nothing, that's nothing. Okay, what they did is they looked at lactates at 24, 48 and 72 hours. And all they looked at was whether the lactate had gotten back to normal, meaning it was below two. What they found is that if your lactate was normalized, that is less than two at 24 hours, 0% of the patients would die. If the patient had a lactate above two at 24 hours, but got it normal by 48 hours, those patients had a mortality of 30%. If they got out to 72 hours and their lactate was still greater than two, those patients had a 65% chance of dying. Therefore, guess what lab we get every morning at 6.30 in the morning on morning blood gas panel on every trauma patient. And when I'm sitting on morning ICU rounds and I have an ICU with 15 patients, trauma patients, I used to always kid that I'd put a red strobe light above every ICU trauma patient's room. And on morning rounds, anybody whose lactate was greater than two, I'd turn the light on and keep it on until somebody showed me that blood gas with a lactate less than two. I don't do that, but generally speaking, if I was stuck with prolonged field care or some of those rescues, like, I still, I'll digress again just for a moment. Doc shared with me the, um, that presentation when you guys went out, jumped onto the, the tanker where the, those guys had been burnt, you ended up piping those guys. Those burn patients were the toughest to resuscitate. But I think, Doc, how many burns, were there like a total of four or five guys on that tanker? How many, how many burns were on that tanker jump when that tanker exploded too? Well, let's say, yeah, let's say at five or four, which would not be unusual. This would be every morning 
because I saw those pictures. You guys had to care for them for two or three days. Every morning I, when I, I woke up from whatever little sleep you got, the first thing I'd be doing to tell me who of those five is sick is I'd be drawing that. So that's your lactate. CBC generally is written, you'll see it in a medical chart written as this kind of a tree, okay? Um, and so, um, the old traditional way is using this algorithm is your white blood cell count goes on the left-hand side, your hemoglobin and hematocrit, which are really reflections of the same thing. You can follow hemoglobin, you can follow hematocrit, you can follow either, you can follow them over ratio. Um, those are put stacked on top of each other and your platelet count is over here on the right-hand side. White count, normal, something less than 10,000 probably less than 12,000 in a stress patient. This is indicative of infection and stress, as you know. Um, you can follow those, and then we'll get into the whole discussion at a later date of what you do as the white count goes up. Hemoglobin hematocrit we've talked about, and that's, you know, my one editorial is I'm glad I'm, I'm not going to retire before I watch whole blood come back. Um, we, we use whole blood here. I don't know if you're aware, but in San Antonio, Texas, we have whole blood on the EMS rates now. And EMS is administering whole blood on the end route. We probably see whole blood administered by EMS two to three times every week. And then platelet count, what do you need to know about platelet count? You probably don't need to know much unless it's less than 100,000. You start paying attention. Less than 50,000, patients won't make clot, right? And why will patients not clot with a low platelet count? As you know, the clotting cascade is all about making platelets stick together. We've talked about AVGs, we've talked about CBCs, we've talked about lactate, we've talked about chems. We're at 255. What do we got questions on? Hey, Doc, I got a quick question. How <laughs> useful would it be to have a uh, rapid lactate finger stick in, uh, in your bag? In your bag, in your role as a point of care only, or in your role as you usually are, which is you might be stuck with them for 30 minutes, three days, three hours, or longer? Uh, potentially both. Yeah, so um, kind of an evasive answer. If you have an ISTAT that gives you base deficit, um, it is well respected that lactate and base deficit both reflect the same thing. So if I had ISTAT and could follow base deficit and it was hard for me, right now as I know them as they exist and not that it couldn't be different, but lactate, the cartridge has to stay refrigerated, which makes it a little tough to carry around. If I could have an ISTAT and base deficit, I wouldn't worry too much. Uh, if somebody could give me a point of care lactate, I would certainly, and it's not costly and it's compact and I can carry it and it's reliable, I would put it on my CCAT on the return pretty 